Hi there, my name's Alex Jenkins, I'm a PhD student at King's College London and I'd like to tell you about some new work I have out about primordial black holes from cusp collapse on cosmic strings. So in a nutshell, uh, we show that cusps on cosmic strings can collapse to form primordial black holes. I'll talk a bit in a second about what cosmic strings are and what cusps are. Uh, and what this means is that there are many more black holes that are formed from cosmic strings than was previously recognised. These black holes have some interesting properties, which means if we see one of them, it could be a smoking gun signal for this mechanism. Uh, and I'll go on to discuss the implications, in particular, how this affects uh, gravitational wave constraints on cosmic strings and how we can place new constraints on cosmic strings using the evaporation of these primordial black holes. So first of all, what are cosmic strings? Um, the easiest way to explain this is to think about a simple a cosmological phase transition where you have a spontaneously broken U1 symmetry. So what this means is I have this kind of Mexican hat potential which has a circular symmetry to it um, with a degenerate uh, circle of, of minima in the potential. And at some point as the universe cools you want to spontaneously drop down into the bottom of that potential and all the points in space are going to pick different different angles on the circle. So I could have a region of space where I execute a non-zero winding around the vacuum. Uh, and what this means is if I go to the centre of that region, I have to be sitting at the top of the Mexican hat again to ensure that everything's smooth and continuous. So you've got some trapped energy density there. And if you string together a bunch of those, of those planes with that non-zero winding, you end up with this line of energy density, which behaves like a string. So we call them cosmic strings. Um, these things are generic and very many theories beyond the standard model of particle physics and they're a really good candidate of something to look for if you're interested in testing uh, fundamental physics or exotic new physics with gravitational waves. Um, we typically describe these things using something called the Nambu-Goto approximation which recognises the enormous hierarchy of scales in the problem. So the width of the string is typically much less than, an than the size of an electron but their length, they're, they're astrophysical objects, so it's, it's typically parsecs or even gigaparsecs. Um, so what that means is it, it's a very good approximation to just say, okay, or treat them as being zero thickness classical strings. One really nice thing about this approximation is then that the strings are described by just a single parameter, the string tension mu. Now we usually write this in the dimensionless combination g mu, which, like with any, uh, with any string, is just equal to the mass per unit length of the string. But with cosmic strings, there's a very nice property that this is intimately linked to the, the scale at which the strings were formed. So this g mu goes like the new physics scale over the Planck scale squared. Um, so if we can measure g mu by, by observing these cosmic strings with gravitational waves, then we can learn about high energy physics processes happening at extreme energy scales. Um, people were initially interested in um, the strings formed at the grand unified theory scale, the gut scale, which gives you g mu of about 10 to the minus 6, although this is now ruled out by observations, and I'll talk about that in a couple of slides. So these strings, effectively, they only interact through gravity, except when they touch each other, like what's shown in this cartoon here. And when this happens, you have this reconnection process where different parts of the string exchange partners and so they come away connected to different parts. Uh, and that will be important on the next slide. So suppose you form a bunch of cosmic strings, you have a phase transition that forms them, what happens then? Well typically uh, from simulations what people find is that you have a few, so sort of order one, long cosmic strings per Hubble volume, uh, which is shown in black in this, in this simulation here. So when I say long strings, I just mean strings which are larger than your Hubble, uh, your Hubble volume, so it looks like they just go on forever. And what happens then is these strings wiggle around because they've got a lot of energy density in them, and if they bend over and, and touch themselves, they can chop off loops through that reconnection process I was talking about on the last slide. So what happens is you tend to fill up your Hubble volume with a very, very large number of cosmic string loops, which are shown in red in this simulation. And these loops wiggle around at relativistic speeds, they emit a lot of energy in gravitational waves and they decay. 
So there are three main ways in which, gra uh, in which loops emit gravitational waves. You can form cusps, which are points on the loop which move instantaneously at the speed of light in a kind of whip-crack motion, uh, and they emit a very strong beam of gravitational waves in a particular direction. You can get these discontinuities called kinks, which propagate around the loop at the speed of light, beaming out gravitational waves like a lighthouse. And if you have two kinks traveling in opposite directions which collide with each other, then this can also emit a burst of gravitational waves. If you add up all the cusps and kinks and kink-kink collisions on all of the loops in the universe, you get this, this cumulative gravitational wave signal, which we see as a stochastic background. And this is the main way of placing constraints on the existence of cosmic strings. Because if the string tension G mu is larger, then there's more energy released in gravitational waves, and so it's easier to, to measure this with the stochastic background. You can also constrain them by looking at the CMB, because CMB photons, which travel past uh, cosmic strings, undergo an integrated Sachs-Wolf effect. Uh, so, so that CMB constraint typically gets you G mu is less than around the gut scale, but we can do a lot better with gravitational waves. So with LIGO and with PTAs, you get, um, you get constraints sort of between 10 to the minus 11 and 10 to the minus 14. Um, there's a lot of variation there, and that's because this depends quite sensitively, unfortunately, uh, on the details of the loop network model. So essentially how many loops there are of different sizes. However, for LISA, um, we, we explored this in a, in a cosmology working group paper that I was involved in last year. Uh, we find that sort of regardless of the loop network model, we'll be able to constrain GMU down to about 10 to the minus 17. So this is orders of magnitude better than any other experiment. So now I'm going to move on to talking about primordial black hole formation from cosmic strings. So it was recognized by uh, Stephen Hawking back in 1989 that if you have a circular loop of cosmic string, it will contract under its tension and it will stay perfectly circular. So it will just contract at an accelerating uh, velocity until it, it's so contracted that it collapses and forms a black hole. Um, so the, the kind of caveat with this mechanism is that you have to be almost exactly circular for this to work because if there's any deviations from that, you get angular momentum, which means this thing spins up as it gets smaller and it's hard to compress it into a small enough volume. So because very few loops uh, are circular enough for this to happen, you end up with very few primordial black holes this way, even if there are loads of loops in the universe. What we've managed to show is that there's a much more generic way of forming primordial black holes from loops. And this comes from the cusps I was mentioning before. So because the cusp is moving at the speed of light instantaneously, and the points around it are also moving very quickly, uh, the, this portion of the loop undergoes some really extreme length contraction, which means it can also collapse. Um, what this means is that rather than the entirety of the loop ending up inside the black hole, it's just a small uh, fraction of it. And in fact, the rest mass of the black hole is something like g mu squared times the total mass of the loop. So much, much smaller. Um, there's this interesting result that the, the spins of these black holes are around two thirds of the maximum value you can get for Kerr black holes. Um, and this kind of universal value is tied to the universal uh, dynamics near a cusp, which is determined by the equations of motion of the string. Because the, the portion of the loop that collapses is moving so quickly compared to the, you know, in the rest frame of the loop, you end up with a black hole which is moving at ultra relativistic velocities. And because, as I mentioned, cusps are a generic feature of cosmic string loops, um, these primordial black holes are generic as well, and you get many, many more of them than in the circular collapse scenario. So if you have a model for the loop network, so how many loops there are of different sizes, you can go away and calculate how many black holes of different masses you'll end up with in this way. So what I'm showing here is the fraction f of the energy density of dark matter that's made up by these black holes uh, and where the x-axis is just different masses. So this is just an example spectrum for one particular value of g mu. But what you can see is that for the different uh, loop network models, so the red, blue and green curves, the spectra that you get are very similar. I should mention that the, the solid lines here 
correspond to black holes formed in the radiation era, and the dotted lines, or sorry, dashed lines, are the ones formed in the matter era, where you have larger loops, so you end up with more massive black holes. Um, most of the black holes that you form in this way are very small, uh, and the ones that lie in this pink region here evaporate due to Hawking radiation in a time much shorter than the Hubble time. Um, so you can use the fact that they produce this Hawking radiation to try to constrain them, and the constraint that we found is something like 10 to the minus 6 for GMU, which is so very you know, similar to existing CMB constraints. Um, the nice thing about this is that it's model independent because these spectra are so similar to each other. Um, this constraint also implies that the black holes formed in this way can't make up more than a very small fraction of the dark matter, so something like 10 to the minus 10. Um, you do, however, aside from the evaporating ones, you do end up with a few uh, black holes which are large enough to survive and, and you know, don't, don't just evaporate into Hawking radiation. And these are typically sort of around asteroid masses of sort of 10 to the minus 18 solar masses or so. So these surviving black holes make up a completely unique population of black holes, right? Through the combination of their small masses which makes them different from astrophysical black holes, but also their large spins, which makes them different from most other primordial black holes. The sort of standard mechanism for forming primordial black holes is you just have a large overdensity in the Earth of the universe, which collapses, but then it, it is born with essentially zero spin. It can gain spin by accreting material, but that's only efficient if, the, if they're sufficiently massive. So this gray region is sort of the allowed uh, region of parameter space for conventional primordial black holes. Uh, the blue and green marks are for different populations of astrophysical black holes, but you can see that this red band for the cusp collapse black holes is clearly identifiable. Um, this cusp collapse also has an effect on the gravitational wave emission from the cusp. So because the, the black hole forms, near or just before the peak of the typical cusp signal, which looks like this in blue, uh, you essentially truncate your signal by half, right? You could get a sort of quasi-normal ringing of the black hole afterwards, but actually this is at extremely high frequencies that won't be observable for us. So the main effect on the gravitational wave emission is just to halve the strain, essentially. If you halve the strain, this means that your gravitational wave energy density that's produced is reduced by a quarter because that goes as strain squared. So the, the stochastic background spectrum that you get is reduced by a factor of one over four for most frequencies. I say for most frequencies because if you go to high enough frequencies, then actually the stochastic background signal is dominated by extremely small loops, which are too small to collapse in this way to form black holes. So you have this kind of crossover between the one-fourth regime and the, and the regime where it's the same as before. This means that the, the effects of this on different uh, stochastic background measurements for different frequency bands changes. So for example, for pulsar timing arrays, they're sitting in this regime where the, the stochastic background spectrum is reduced. So the constraints on GMU that we get from them are weakened by something like half an order of magnitude. However, for LISA, LISA is sensitive to such small values of GMU, and, and this kind of crossover regime moves to lower and lower frequencies as you decrease GMU. So actually for LISA, because it can probe down to about GMU 10 to the minus 17, we see no difference at all. So, which is, is good news, because it means that when LISA flies, it will have just as much constraining power for, for cosmic string models as it did before. Okay, so that's pretty much everything I wanted to say. So just to summarize, we've shown that uh, cusps on cosmic strings can collapse to form primordial black holes. And this means that there are many more primordial black holes that are formed from cosmic strings than has been recognized before. Um, these black holes are ultra relativistic and highly spinning, which makes them an, an interesting, unique population. Um, and this has some interesting implications for gravitational wave constraints and also for um, the evaporation of these primordial black holes. So thank you very much for listening.